The cybersecurity landscape is full of single solution providers, making it easy for unexpected cyber threats to sneak through the cracks. That's why Fortress is creating a stronger, simpler strategy for protection, one that increases your security maturity while decreasing the operational burden that comes with it. This is all possible thanks to Fortress' best-in-class portfolio and deep bench of expert problem solvers. Fortress' integrated, scalable solutions help customers face their toughest challenges with confidence. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra, F-O-R-T-R-A. If your organization is ready to embrace edge computing, we have good news. The 2023 AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report provides everything you need to know to get started. In the report, we identify the common characteristics of edge computing. We found edge use cases are rapidly coming online, and we reveal how to secure edge computing, which is a dynamic, nonlinear, and unconventional approach to computing. Most importantly, you'll learn how to prepare for your edge ecosystem. Get your complimentary copy of the report today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ATT cybersecurity. That's securityweekly.com forward slash ATT cybersecurity. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Join us at an upcoming official cybersecurity summit in a city near you. The series of one day invitation only executive level conferences are designed to educate senior cyber professionals on the latest threat landscape. We're pleased to offer our listeners $100 off admission when you use code SECWEEK23 to register. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash cybersecurity summit to learn more and register today. All right, today we are talking to Farida Shahid, who joins us to talk about internet safety. Farida specializes in helping parents protect their kids online. Her work has been featured in dozens of media outlets. She gives gives interviews, speaks at conferences, and creates a lot of online content on the topic of online security. And she's also the founder and CEO of Sekuva, an organization dedicated to internet safety training and education. Welcome to the show, Farida. Thank you for having me, Adrian. I should also mention that uh, I've been an organizer of B-Sides Knoxville for uh, a decade now. We're coming up on on the 10th. And Farida actually keynoted one of those events. I, I think it was uh, Kelly Shortridge uh, keynoted in 2018. And we have this tradition where the previous year's keynote speaker picks the next year year's keynote speakers. And I love this tradition because I would have never known who Farida was uh, without Kelly Shortridge giving me uh, a short list of four or five potential uh, candidates. Uh, a, a lot of keynote speakers don't like to just choose a single one, uh, though that does happen. Uh, so a lot of them will give me like a list of folks, like like here's four or five uh, good candidates for for next year's keynote. And one of the reasons I picked you, Farida, is I, I saw that you had worked with Toastmasters. You know, and, you know, funny as it is, a lot of the people who give talks, even a lot of the, the really sought after speakers, you can tell like they could probably use some professional training on speaking uh, on a stage, you know, in front of a camera, that that kind of thing. Uh, you know, even though they're they're highly respected in their craft and what they do, you can tell they're, they're not trained. They don't have a background in public speaking, right? So it really impressed me that, that you set out to, uh, to nail that down. Well, thank you. I mean, shout out to Kelly. When I heard that that was the tradition you were doing at B-Sides, I thought, oh my God, like more organizations need to do that because you get to find people randomly that you would never find like me. And of course, shout out to Toastmasters. I mean, that's the beginning of everything in terms of my public speaking journey. So I very much appreciate them. And I highly recommend anyone in security, especially if you do meetings or you're talking to stakeholders all the time, or you have to do presentations that you do sign up for a Toastmaster. And then one of the candidates you gave me for the next year is uh, I'm in Eltua, who I just met uh, in person the first time at uh, RSA this year. And we went and had coffee together and we geeked out about coffee. Oh, my God. I, I love it. I love this edition so much. I really wish more people would do it. <laughs> me too. Me, and it was just me being lazy, not wanting to pick a keynote speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, laziness oh. is what like the best things are invented because of either laziness or the need for something. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Um, so so yeah, going going through Toastmasters. Uh, I mean, this has been we we're just talking about uh, that that besides was uh, four years ago now. 
Um, was that part of a plan? Like, like had you started Sekuva at that point and you realized that you're going to be creating a lot of online content and that you needed this? Or was it more um, because you knew you wanted to speak at conferences uh, or, or, or a bit of both? I've always been a speaker. So I was elected as like my middle school class, pre not class president, like the entire middle school president. <laughs> like at what, how old was I then? I think I was like 12 years old. I can't remember. 12, yeah. So yeah, and I got that because I did a whole speech in front of the whole school. So they elected me to take care of everything. And I <laughs> loved speaking so that it just came naturally. So when I saw that my corporate job had like a Toastmasters team or like a club, basically, I said, okay, I have to definitely join this. And I was working in cybersecurity awareness. And one of the main things with cybersecurity awareness is talking to people. And we did a lot of lunch and learns and workshops. And I had a horrible habit of saying, you know, I didn't say, um, as much as, you know, you know, you know, you know, and mm, one of yeah. the workshops that we were doing, I was counting how many times I said, you know, in about an hour. And I, I believe I went over between 60 to hundred times within one hour. And I Same. was like, I was shocked. I was, I, I was absolutely not never doing this again. I have to learn how to do public speaking. Back then I had no idea about content creation. I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't really know about influencers. The only influencers I knew were like fashion or makeup. And I didn't know you could be an influencer for education or let alone cybersecurity. So that wasn't on my mind. I did not like posting on Instagram anywhere personally i'd never like posting online i've always been a gamer so i had that was not even in my viewpoint at that point right yeah and, and it's um you know I've, I've done it's so painful to listen to yourself right you know if you're if you're not used to doing it and you know is is mine also that that's that's my thinking word that i have to be very conscious of to eliminate and it's especially when you're talking yeah, to other people <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, and it's tough. It's tough. It's, uh, you know, when I'm thinking, it's just so unnatural to leave like an empty space there, to leave some silence there, but it sounds so much better than filling it with something. It really does. Another thing I had was talking too fast. And I do get that on my YouTube comments sometimes. People will say, you talk way too fast. And then so I realize, okay, well, I can't change the video. So I usually report and say, you can slow down the video on YouTube if you need to, but moving forward, I will try to talk slower. So right now I am intentionally talking slower. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I mean, for you, has it been just practice? Like, uh, did you make a, a habit of going back? Well, so you, so I produce a lot of live content. So it, like what, what happens here is exactly what goes to YouTube. I don't have a chance for to edit it or, or to fix it or to take out the ums or anything like that. Like it's, it's just going to go out. But, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you do, you do have an opportunity to edit. Like how much are you editing that stuff versus just, uh, just trying to, trying to first take everything. And I'll, I just want to talk about creator type stuff of, of just for maybe another minute or two, because, uh, Katie and Sean are bursting with questions about, uh, on <laughs> online safety and stuff like that. Oh yeah. I mean, look, I'm game for anything because I'm a content creator and I always do like interviews, always do videos. So I'm, I'm get down for anything, but in terms of how I edit my videos, it depends on what video I'm doing. I love YouTube live streams because I don't have to edit anything. I just go yeah. live. I can just be me. I don't have to put captions. It's auto captioned. I don't have to do anything. I just talk and I'm there and I end live and it, there's a replay, but I do really enjoy creating short form videos and those videos, I do edit it, but because I'm typically not talking in one breath, it's typically one point and then I'll pause and I'll look at my notes or think about the next thing I want to say. And then I'll record, not record again, but I'll, then I'll talk again. So I typically never have ums or buts or, you knows in those moments because it's, there's, I'm not used to doing that because I'm not just talking. And if I am just talking, then it's a harder thing to edit. And I never take out my ums and you knows typically. I just let, let it be there. All right. All right. Yeah. It's, it's, um, yeah. And, and that's something I'm going to have to get used to doing. Uh, we're, we're starting a podcast, uh, where I work that will be a more edited, you know, me talking to an empty room, more, more of me reading off notes and in, in a script, but, um, but yeah, so, so I want to get to your company to what, uh, Sakuva does 
and the relation between, like, I assume that's kind of like the foundation for the Safe Kids movement and a lot of the other stuff you do. So I just want to create some context uh, for, for what you do as a job versus the community work. Is it all part of the same thing before we dive into specific questions about online safety and internet safety? Yeah, this is my first year full time as a business owner, as a content creator. So my business is what I do full time. And I can't remember the other thing you said, but that's the thing. I was like, yeah, no, actually, that's what I do all the time. So my entire focus is creating educational content for parents to learn how to protect their kids online. And then, of course, working with organizations on campaigns and workshops and sessions and things like that. So you you know, we're talking about uh, stuff you should and shouldn't do as a as a creator. And one of the things as an interview uh, interviewer you should never do is ask multiple questions and and then you know, let let your interview. <laughs> I didn't even catch try. that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, just trying to understand like like where Sakuva fits in with all the other stuff you do is is, is that just kind of uh, you know the your, your business is the foundation of a lot of the like the free stuff that you post the the shorts and things like that, that's all just marketing for Sakuva. Like you get to do your passion and your community work uh, on top of your your business. Is, is that how you have things set up? Correct. I mean, it happened accidentally, but that's what how it's set up. Sakuva is just the official name of the business. So that's just the legal name of everything. And the forward facing is my personal brand, Cyber Farida. And then my recently renamed community, the Protect Kids Online movement, and everything is more community-based, content-focused. So like 80% of what people see is all free content, free stuff, free resources, free free everything. And then on the back end, the rest are things that are paid. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Um... Katie, if if you wanna if you wanna leap in here first, I, I know you guys have some questions. Let let's get into talking about online safety, internet. Safety. I do. I, I I do actually want to go a little bit back to the content creation aspect of it because I think it's really important. The delivery of it, the delivery of awareness, training, online safety, it can be really awful. And it could be really good. So you referred to yourself as an influencer. And I don't think everybody can do that job. There's a certain it factor. So what are the things that you use? What are your go to's? Are there tactics and techniques not to get to cybersecurity, e, but tactics and techniques that you like to incorporate when you're creating these conversations, these videos, these YouTube live segments? That's question one. Well, first I had to get used to being an influencer. I didn't like the term. I felt like that was weird. I didn't feel like I fit. I felt like it was only for certain industries. And then I had to get over it very quickly um, after my audience grew. And that's what people started to call me. And when the companies reached out, they were like, oh, influencer marketing, influencer partnership. So I got over it fast. Second, I'm very, very intentional in how I show up online. Like every tiny thing that you see is very well thought out. So the fact that I wear pink is thought out. The fact that I have these particular earrings thought out. The fact that I have flowers behind me thought out. Like everything, the color scheme, how I show up, how I talk to people, every single thing is very, very intentional. The words that I say to people, what I say in videos, what I say in the comments, what I DM people, how I DM, everything's super intentional. And it comes from my love of psychology, human behavior, and connection with other people. And so that is one of the biggest things I believe that has to come first when you're creating content, especially around a topic that is very sensitive in terms of internet safety. But then we're talking about people's children, and there's nothing more precious to someone who has a child than their child. Of course, I, I think you're probably being a little humble. There is an it factor that's probably not attainable by all people, but I'll leave that there. Um, so my follow-up question is about actually creating the content and tailoring it. What are some of the processes that you use? Because these are such sensitive subjects. And there's so much that's out of people's hands when it comes to the online attack surface. So how do, how do you start to think about putting together this content in a way that's consumable by people who don't work in tech and effective using those psychology strategies? 
So I think what information would be impactful in this moment and what actions can they take based off what I'm saying? So if they cannot take any meaningful action in the moment, then I may not post it or I may post it, but then I would give them a way to change their mindset about what's happening because you can control how you feel about something or how you deal with something. And so if a particular news story is coming out, then I would say, okay, here's how you might wanna approach it for yourself, or here's how we can think about this a little bit differently, just so people understand that they have agency and control over what they consume internally as, as a person. That's really important to me. And so I honestly, I invested a lot in mentors, business mentors, um, personal mentors, cybersecurity mentors, and I listened to them intently and I have notes upon notes and upon notes of what they told me. And people who came before me, if they said to do something and it did not conflict with my morals and values, then I went ahead and I did it. And I have like a whole sheet of, okay, here are my morals, here are my values, here are the things that I will not post. If I post something that's trauma traumatic or sensitive or how am I going to deal with it? So if you see on my Instagram, when I post something that's really, really difficult to digest, something that's very sad, something that's traumatic, something that's triggering, the very next post or a next post, like two posts later, I will always post something positive. So I make sure that I have positive stories and negative stories. And then of course I research what hooks are the best for the video, what topics are best, the call to action, how I'm speaking in the video, I, I'm really spoiled with my audience. I can create a, a six, not six minute video. I can create like a, a minute and a half video, three minute video on Instagram, and it can still do well. Other people, you have to stick to 30 seconds to 50 seconds, 15 seconds. I can do whatever I want so long as the video is good. <laughs> so that's nice. Why do you think that is? Is it the audience? Is it that your content's really engaging? Is it the, the subject just needs a little bit more explanation? I think it's the topic and the way that I approach it. So not every video works really well. So there are certain 15 second videos that do horribly. And then there's certain like 90 second videos that do phenomenally. I believe it's really the topic and then how I edit it. So I make sure there's no pauses in my video as much as humanly possible. It's If it's a video where I want it to be like we're having a conversation and we're talking, I will allow pauses. But other than that, I'm like meticulous in editing it where there's absolutely zero pause down to like, 0.001 second. <laughs> There's just, I don't want to pause at all because I want to keep people engaged. Um, the only time I don't edit heavily like that is if I'm sharing someone else's video and I do want the video to be seen. So I will start the video, then I'll show the video, then I'll end the video myself. But it really depends on the content. Sometimes I just stitch someone else's video and they have a really awesome video and I don't feel like making the video myself. So I'll react to their video and then I will just add some useful information in the caption so that people, once they finish the video, they read it. And because they stay longer, because I said there's something in the caption and they share it and they comment, then the video starts to do very well. So I believe it's the topic really, most of all. This is really interesting to me, Frida. Um, I published a lot of content in cybersecurity on my uh, blog years ago, 80security.org. I'm also a founder. I also take the approach of putting out a lot of free content that drives people towards um, paid content, but ultimately that you're providing value or they wouldn't want it. And you're also providing a service to do good, to help other people. Uh, so I certainly can relate to that as well as uh, has, I've spoken at a bunch of conferences and, and certainly understand those challenges around these social words like, um, like, so, et cetera. And you know, <laughs> so, when we're when we're talking about these things, it, it definitely resonates me, as I'm sure it resonates with a number of people in the audience. I wanted to dive into kind of this topic around kids and protecting kids. So I have kids, parents have kids by definition. And one of the things that I think is one of the challenges, kids are on their phones a lot. And I'm sure you've heard this, you, you know this. They're on their phones a lot. You can argue whether that's good or bad or other. Uh, a lot of times it's an opportunity for the parent to, to let the child do whatever so that the parent can do what they want to do. How do you feel about monitoring content on the, 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 the child's device versus um, controlling and managing those installed app, uh, apps that are on the phone versus trust? And what does that balance look like? What do you think it should be? I mean, obviously, from a parent perspective, there's got to be a balance of those, some trust and in information that's shared with the child about what the concerns are from the parent side. 
But really, how do you feel that balance can be made to ensure that the child is both safe online, but you can continue that that positive relationship between the parent and the child and that that electronic device doesn't get in the way of that? I mean, there's two thought process with that. So number one, of course, like the security of parental control apps and whether or not you want to use it. Um, that actually, that topic is what grew my Instagram page. I went from like 6,000 followers to like 109 in like two months because of wow. that a video went to like 2 million views because I talked about parental controls and monitoring your child's device and how a lot of parental control apps have security issues. And so we can go to that topic in terms of should you, should you monitor your kid's device and should you use parental controls? And then, but I know you focus a lot more on the balance of it, like the balance of privacy, security, and safety. You don't want to, you want to make sure you're managing their time on the device and they're not getting too addicted to it. They're not seeing things they shouldn't see, but also you want to manage your mental health. I believe it's a balance that depends on the child, depends on the family, depends on what they're doing. Is it homework? Is it research? Are they learning how to hack? Are they learning how to code? Is it too much? Are are there any behavior changes with with what they're doing? And then like setting expectations when you give them the phone in the first place so that they know this phone is just borrowed until I make my own money and I can pay my own phone bill. And so managing expectations, always talking, knowing that them knowing that they can talk to you about whatever they want and you will not get upset with them. You're not going to look down upon them. You're not going to love them less. You're not going to take away their devices unless it's something very, very, very serious that you have to. So like setting those expectations and always talking to them is a great way to manage privacy um, and the balance of it. I remember I did this video with the psychologist who was talking about the psychology of not having privacy or having privacy. And she believes there's like this very delicate balance that you have to take, especially as teens get older, because they want autonomy and they want to be able to do their own thing. And so it's really trial and error, honestly, because it depends on the child. There's like a baseline, there's a foundation of what to do. And then you always say, you're the parent, you're the expert in your child. So you have to figure out based off of their behaviors, your goals and their goals for themselves, what is best for them and how do you manage time in that way? And how do you uh, manage their privacy? That makes a lot of sense. And I, if I can just jump I love, in real go ahead and, and add something real quick, Sean. You know, this, this was a journey I went way down the rabbit hole with when my kids were younger. And I noticed with my oldest kid, you know, just talking about how each kid is different, um, like there was a specific time limit. And if they had screen time and it, it could have been TV, it could have been on a device, didn't matter what it was, but over an hour, I, I, I'd lose them. Like it, it was extremely difficult without a meltdown to separate them from whatever, uh, you know, TV show, movie, uh, you know, using a device or something like that. So screen time was super important. Like, like I had to make sure that screen time was, uh, like each session was limited, you know, and the total for the day was limited to a certain amount of time. Cause I, I would literally lose them to where, you know, taking it away was, was disruptive and, and, you know, they'd have a fit. And, uh, and once I realized that, once I realized that it was, is some point like 45 minutes or less than an hour, no problem getting them off the device at all. And, uh, and I'd also set up things where like, I didn't have to like ask them for the, their device or take it away. I would set it up to where they had a certain amount of time. And when that ran out, they had to do a chore to earn more time. And then when that ran out, like, like it wasn't me turning off the internet and taking it away. <laughs> it, it, it was just, you know, a built-in natural consequence built into their device as, as far as they were concerned. It was like, this thing is fueled by chores, this this phone I'm holding, right? I know someone else said that, like, if your child is, uh, not someone else, I who is she? It's Dr. I can't remember her name, but she's like, I believe she was a pediatrician, but she was saying that if you want to manage that the the emotions they have after getting off the device do like an activity, like a physical activity after. So if they spent like two hours gaming, then like she'll have like a dance party with her kids or they'll do push-ups. You're like, how many push-ups can you do? It was like something interesting. I thought that was a, a good way to approach it for her kids. I mean, everyone's different. Yeah. Sorry, Sean, I just wanted to share that anecdote back to you. Oh, no worries. I, I like that approach. It makes a lot of sense. And from what, Frida, you were saying is is really it's about relationship things, relationships with people, relationships with your kids. It's 
and making sure that expectations are managed, that there's boundaries that are that are clear and that are set, and that the communication is is a very important part of that. So I really uh, respect and appreciate you you highlighting those key points, and it just shows that you have a really strong psychology approach to this, which which I do as well. One of the things that I've talked to other parents about is really around as you said, the impact of what they're using. Are they learning something or are they interacting with something and is it affecting their mood? And I've heard from other parents where the use of certain apps or certain social media tends to drop the the, the, the kid's mood. And so that's a concern. How would you how have you handled that? What are your what are your sort of your advice around that, especially when it comes to social media and preteens and teenagers when it's a lot more difficult to kind of pull those things back? managing who you're following. So like going through the lists and going, okay, uh, there's, what's her name? Marie Kondo. I think I'm saying her name, right? Yeah. Where she would say yeah, like, yeah, does this, yes. yeah. Like, does this bring you joy? So like you can spark go into joy. your, yeah. You, yeah, exact. Does it spark joy? So it's like this account does not spark joy. Okay. That account is gone. This account sparks joy. Okay. We keep this account and it's more <laughs> like figuring out, okay, what do I like? What do I not like? And, and then talking to your kids about, okay, if somebody consistently makes you feel a certain way, do you feel like you want to follow them? Like you want to continue to follow this person or you want to continue to consume this content? Sometimes it's more difficult because you're on TikTok and you're on the For You page and it's not necessarily who you're following, but it's the things that you're seeing. So I recommend, highly encourage parents to know what apps their kids are on so that you can see like, okay, you can click not interested or block this person, or I don't want news about this. So I block all politic news. I hate politics, like with a passion. And so I block all news with politics. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. And because it, it just destroys my mood, I don't like it. And so I keep saying not interested. And so TikTok knows don't show Farida any politic type of TikTok. Otherwise she's not going to like it. And then reminding your kids what they engage with is what they're going to continue see, continuously see. Now, I always say that like, behavior stuff is always deeper than technology. So that's just like technology stuff. But if they're consistently sad or consistently drawn to sad content, then that means there's something underlying that's happening that's way beyond TikTok and Instagram. And so I would do a little curious investigation into why they're so upset, sad or upset in that particular moment. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think one of the things that we kind of get away from with technology is that there's other things that kids can do, coloring, drawing, et cetera, that are creative outlets. So uh, the technology is very much a push towards us or a pull. We're looking for it versus something that we can do and interact with. And I think we there's there's a balance. Again, it comes down to the balance. Um, I'm going to ask a direct question uh, about social media apps. And certainly when you're looking at middle schoolers versus high schoolers, there's a lot of pressure for uh, kids of these age to be on social media apps. Are there certain social media apps that you have more concern about from a privacy, uh, security, even social interaction perspective of, of one versus the other at these ages? I have, I don't know if it's a controversial opinion, but I believe that the apps that people immediately think about in terms of being safe or not safe for kids, we definitely have to talk about that and they're definitely apps you have to be aware of. But I believe the most dangerous apps are the apps that no one knows about, <laughs> no one's paid attention to. Because yeah. kids know that, okay, yeah, you are going to be worried about Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat, especially Snapchat, because things disappear. It's the whole thing, the whole nine yards. And But you may not know that Twitter is a hub for a lot of explicit things. As many parents don't know that. And so they're their child has Twitter and they're thinking, yeah, they have a Twitter account, whatever, or they have Kick, or they have some, they have Omegle or Omegle, however you want to pronounce it. Like just random apps, like a Hangout app, um, video chatting apps that you're not looking for, that you don't understand or you don't think about, and they're used for other things. So I believe those are more to worry about than any of the, the big ones, you have to worry about it, but because there's so much focus on it, you most likely are going to find crazier things on the apps that you're not paying attention to. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My personal opinion is that there is danger inherent with any of the social media sites for a kid, be it the content they see, view, be it the interactions that they may have, um, the the 
just expansive uh, nature of it just it introduces them to a whole other world that they may or may not be able to handle depending on the age and depending on the child. So my opinion is that there there is dangers and and potential risk with that. It's a and it's a matter of the parent to work with the child and talk through that and and explain. Just like if you don't like hearing bad language and you don't want your child to hear it, they're probably going to hear some sort of music or content uh, that has some bad language in it. It's more about talking to them about it, saying, hey, you know, you can always turn that off. You can always change the channel, so to speak. Same thing with social media and other things. And I think at least, again, my personal opinion is a lot of the child protection type components of apps aren't really up to speed, aren't really the best at keeping uh, you know, up on, on what's happening and what's being done. So therefore, there is some requirement or some sort of oversight to it, to some extent, for the parent to work with the child and at least be understanding of what they're talking about. Do you agree with that or do you have a different take? Oh, no, I thousand percent agree with that. A hundred percent. I believe like social media is, oh my God. I mean, it's opening up a can of worms. It's, it's, it, you have to be ready for every single conversation under the sun. I mean, it's literally, there's no conversation that's not on social media. And so if you're not comfortable having conversation about anything in the world, then it's, they're not ready for social media. I believe the best age in general, I'm not saying for every single child, just in general, to join is like 16 years old. 16 years old is a good base foundational age to join social media, but they can join a little bit earlier, or a little bit later or never at all. They don't have to join up. One of the biggest questions I get is, should my child join? I'm like, no, your child shouldn't join. There's no should in social media. It's, you can do whatever you want. The only time I've seen it work super, super well besides, I mean, some anomalies is children that go on social media with a purpose and they're managed by their parents. So they have a business, they have an impact, they have right. a goal. And those are the kids that you see on Time Magazine and the Forbes list and all those other things where they're really young and they're doing some phenomenal things online. And their parent is like, yeah, I'm managing their TikTok account or Instagram account or whatever. Those you've seen like do super well. Or kids that are just, I mean, honestly, and this is my believe, and I say this all the time, and I, I'm going to start talking more about this, the biggest way to protect a child online has everything to do with therapy and human connection with your child. And the more that your child understands themselves and feels that I am enough, that I'm not too different, that anything that I want is available to me, that I am good as I am, that I can make mistakes, that I'm human, that I'm beautiful, that I am worthy, that is like groundbreaking. And they feel that I have at least two to three people in my life that are adults that are safe, that I can talk to. I don't feel like I have to hide. I don't feel like I am horrible internally. Then they're safer than anything else. The kids that we see do a lot of things online. And by the way, I was online. Like as a kid, I started gaming at 13, talking to strangers, doing like crazy stuff online. That's how I got this is why I'm so passionate about this. I had a lot of like internal trauma that I had to work through. And the whole reason why I was doing all these crazy things was because I was broken up inside and not because I had a horrible childhood. I actually had by all means, like a pretty good childhood. It was just, there are certain things that happened that really, really messed me up internally. And so I was just drawn to doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. I I absolutely I keep saying this. I absolutely love what you just said, and I hope that Security Weekly can take a clip of what you just said. Not maybe not the end part about trauma, but the focus really on the child and feeling loved and encouraged and safe. Um, that means so much. Like that is that is the world to the child. And that's the important part. Like that's what we should be doing as as parents is imbuing them, encouraging them, giving that take so that they don't feel like they need a crutch, so to speak. And I think a lot of times social media becomes this, is, is part of this peer pressure. Oh, well, everyone's on Snapchat. Everyone's on TikTok. Everyone's doing this. Everyone is doing this. I heard it from my kids. Everyone in school has a cell phone. And I'm like, okay, well, if everyone in school has a cell phone, you don't need one because you could ask any of your friends to use it if you have to make a call to call us. So I also appreciate point. you pointing out, yeah, they, they, my, my kids don't appreciate the fact that I use logic against them <laughs> or use logic in arguments. But I, th I really appreciate you saying that 16 seems like a good age because it it is tough for the parent to go, all right, well, what seems too young for what? You know, from YouTube on a television that's shared in the family room, maybe you can you can guide and manage that. But if no one's around to guide and manage that, who knows what the what the kid is watching, you know? And and I think the approach of 
having the relationship, talking to them about it, and and making it something that you work on together, kind of like what Adrian was talking about. Hey, this is the time you can use it for. When that's up, then you can earn it by doing this and kind of staying back and just having more of the guidelines. So that way the parent isn't necessarily being the bad person in the relationship. But the technology, the other thing you said that I really love, Frida, was it's not your phone. It's my phone as the parent. I pay for it. When you're old enough, you can have your own phone. You can do whatever you're, you know, at 18, you can do whatever you want. But my job as a parent is to kind of shepherd you along and make sure that the technology is a tool, is another utility that you have. But the phone is not a privilege. It is not a, I'm sorry, it's a right. It's not a right. It's a privilege. This is something that you have because there should be some enjoyment, some sort of entertainment that comes out of it. And if there is an enjoyment, if you seem sad every time you're, you're going to using it, or if it, we're going to have to talk about that and work through it. And I, I really appreciate that perspective. So thank you. Thank you. I love, um, one of my analogies that I love is that if you wouldn't let your child unsupervised to walk to the park by themselves and hang out with their friends and come back or to the mall or whatever, then they shouldn't be online by themselves. They would need some type of supervision from you. And that's the that's the threshold where you realize, okay, are they responsible? Are they mature? Do they understand safe in terms of safety, who to call? And if if you're at that point where they can go to school by themselves, go to the park by themselves, hang out with their friends, come back at a good hour, and you know, it would, I mean, of course, you're still going to be worried about them, but you know, in general, that they're going to be fine, then they're ready for social media without you. Thank you. Yeah, that that's um. Yeah, and, it, and and there's so much, right? Like like for me, just just keeping up with uh, with the different apps and and what's going like like for me to be able to talk to my kids, I have to understand some of these TikTok trends, right? Like to even speak the same language as them, and uh, and I, I've resisted being on tip tick uh, TikTok, and they'll send me stuff, and I can watch it without having the app installed or or having an account, but uh, but still, it's it's been a challenge and. You know, I, I let my kids uh, create social media accounts when they were 13, um, and it was a battle to wait that long. Like it was, uh, you know, we're, we were very tech tech heavy in, in our house, and, uh, and, and that, that was kind of tough. But uh, Frida, I wanted to track back. I, I think earlier on you mentioned uh, parental, uh, you know, there's so many different types of parental controls. Some of them are built into the operating system. Some of them are third-party apps. I was just sharing in the Discord that the one that I found the most useful that I used a lot was uh, was called Screen Time, ScreenTimeLabs.com. And uh, you know, back in the day, it was one of the only ones where I could I could uh, limit the amount of screen time, which was the the thing I found was really important, uh, especially with my older older child. But um, but yet you said something about some of them being insecure or, or, or bad for, for some reason or another. Uh, is this something that you get into a lot? Do you test out these different apps? Do you review them? Oh, no, there's no way I'm testing. <laughs> uh, so I I found, because I was looking for this, I knew I was like, something has to be up with some of these parental control apps because I would go to their website and it was just giving me, I just had a gut feeling. And so I thought, I mean, right. if there's, bad security for regular apps why don't why don't we have any conversation about the security of parental monitoring apps like if a hacker were able to hack into an app and find out where your kid is at any given moment and the messages they sent that's really really bad and so i did i was doing all this research for like a year or so and i finally came um came across like these two research papers. It was public. I found it because I'm always on FTC.gov. That was when I was working in corporate. And um, they, 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 they didn't publish it, but they published someone else's research paper around the parental control apps that didn't have good security. And so it was like a lot of the parental control apps that many parents were using. And I read that research paper like three times before I talked about it. And I felt I didn't want to talk about it because you're talking about other companies and, you know, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. But then what basically what they found was certain parental control apps did not have security in terms of a hacker could get in, they could read a child's messages, the videos they send, the pictures they send, they can get the username and password of the parent and act like they're the parent. And there's like, there's so many things that so many of the apps were going through in terms of security. And so I talked about it and that's what made the video. So I don't do the security research. However, since then, because of the video and because I published a couple of videos on it since then, a lot of people ask me like, is there any updates? And I always wanted updates. So I part 
partnered with um, PTP. I'm like, damn, I think, yeah, I can say that publicly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd NDA with that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I partnered with Pentis Partners so that anytime any parental control company wanted to reach out to me, because they all, they, I get so many emails from parental control companies or parental monitoring companies asking if I can promote their services. But I don't feel right. comfortable doing that because I have, I have a, I was about to say the Arabic word because I grew up in the Middle East. I was about to say amana. Amana basically means a very, very strong responsibility to your community and to your soul to make sure you're doing something right. And so I felt like I needed someone who has the expertise in pen testing because that's not my expertise to go through the apps and to ask some security questions. So now I have a partner that does that. And now I am in that space of researching parental control apps. And I'm about to have like a, what two meetings tomorrow about this. So it's very exciting, but also nerve wracking. But yeah. Yeah, that, that's it's really tough. I, I was doing product reviews also, and, and and there's definitely a line you have to walk there. And, and that was for B two B companies for for enterprise security products. Uh, you know, when you get into the uh, consumer space, which, which is something I wanted to do. Uh, you know, and, and and there's there's a little bit more work there. I've seen Consumer Reports do some work there. Uh, I think Wirecutter did some work there. You know, there, there's a few different organizations that have dug into uh, some of these apps. But yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like the I had that uh, Circle Media product, which was like a little box you could buy at Target. And, and the issue I had with the app on my kids' uh, mobile devices. You know that would limit what they could get to, how much screen time they had. Is it only worked on the phones? Like, like the kids could just go over to the Xbox and then you know uh, spend as long as they needed there. So I needed something that would do the same thing there. And it was interesting the way this device worked. Uh, it was kind of ingenious. It, it would do uh, ARP route poisoning. Uh, you know, Sean will probably know what I'm talking about there to interrupt interrupt the connection to the router. So basically, it put itself in between the Xbox or whatever the other device was and the router, so I could enforce that screen time. So after 30 minutes of of using the device, uh, it would literally just in the network jump in the middle of that uh, connection and and cut it off. But they, they were so smart about it that they even put it like I had no idea this device had a battery in it. So if the kid realized, oh, this device is preventing me from, you know, playing Halo or, or whatever they're, they're trying to do, uh, they can try and unplug it. And it still has eight hours of battery life, even if they unplug it, because it's connected to the <laughs> Wi-Fi and has a that's battery smart. built into it. I was like, that's, that's genius. Like nowhere <laughs> on the box or in the marketing did I see it having a battery. Uh, and my kids did exactly that. They discovered, oh, this is the thing preventing me from getting online. I'll just remove the power. And it stayed on. <laughs> I oh believe it's God, called Circle. Genius. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Circle, yeah. Sorry, I, I just I kind of went down a rabbit hole there. Uh, I should have had a question there. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, the point is that that's good work that needs to be done. You know, because a lot of these apps and, and devices are, are built by small companies, small teams. And, and like anything else, you know, getting something to market um, you know, often security gets skipped, right? It's yeah, really my unfortunate. Kids were get, my kids were getting to the age of uh, phone versus smartwatch. I looked at uh, and, and did a lot of research around the smartwatches that were for kids, and, and pretty much every one of them seemed they're to have bad. some horrible level of security. And I passed on all of them, ended up with an Apple Watch, because it was the only one that I felt like I could trust from a privacy and security perspective. What about the Samsung watches? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, Samsung smartwatches, I think will be fine. It just is, is the Android ecosystem and, and that connection. You just have to check on that. Yeah, that's but the it's only also thing. Google I mean, or yeah, Samsung, I, I saw so. the same exact thing. Like I did a whole YouTube video on the the insecurity, I guess you could say, of the smartwatches. And it was very interesting. I mean, I think it was, no, I can't remember which country. Some European country banned it. Like they're like, you can't have it. Like it's so bad that they took some companies off. They got it was it was very very interesting. They did, did a whole public service announcement to parents to stop buying them. Um, so I mean, obviously, we didn't get to that point in the U.S. And it was I don't I think it was only one or two European countries that actually did that. Wow. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Frida, there's so much that we haven't even gotten to here. I'm just looking at my notes here. And there's so much. Uh, and before you even came on, uh, my, my co-hosts were already saying in our back channel chat, we, we need to have you on again. So uh, I, I think we'll definitely have to extend this to uh, to a second one. But before we wrap this up, I just want I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on now, anything you you want to promote or, or where people can find you online, that that kind of thing. I mean, I'm always doing something. I have an event that I'm doing in October for National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so the sign-up page for that is not out yet. That's everything going on in the background, but that's what I'm doing. And I plan to do that annually. So if people go to Cyber Frida, if you Google Cyber Frida, if you type it on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, it doesn't really matter, you'll find me. So if you put Cyber Frida in Google or Frida Shahid, you should, or Sakuva, you could find my company. And if you have friends and family members that are non tech savvy or they're tech savvy, uh, they're in security and they have kids and they want to stay up to date with what's happening in the kid safety world for internet, um, for the internet, then feel free to follow me there. And thank awesome. you that we have so much, there's so many things you talk about. There's so many realms that you can get into with this topic. So I appreciate y'all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Next time, you know, I want to, cause I, I know you, you don't just work with kids, right? Like you, you do some training for, for adults and for private companies. And, you know, I wanted to ask questions about, you know, what, what the differences uh, you, you find are there in, in, uh, in dealing with those two different segments, you know, we, we're in the back channel talking about everything from kids to uh, aging parents, right. You know, because uh, you know, there, there's internet safety conversations to have, uh, uh, on both ends and it, everywhere in between. It really is. It's never ending. It's very fun. I very I much love what I do very much. It's amazing. <laughs> 10 out of 10. It highly shows. recommend. It shows. <laughs> thank We're very you. glad you do it. it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Frida, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. We're definitely going to gonna have you back soon. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll be right back in a few moments with the weekly enterprise news. 